Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Toppert. I'm joined by my other team members, Yuval, David, Robert, and Caleb. We are team eight, and our project is Luminous Navigation Markers. Our faculty advisor is Dr. Phillips, um, and our project manager is Dr. Pate. So the purpose of our project was to create a prototype for a luminous navigation marker that can be used by astronauts on extravehicular activities, or EVAs, by lighting their path and the surrounding area. So NASA plans to return to the moon in 2024 as part of Project Artemis, um, which this time around will focus specifically on the lunar south pole. Um, there's a couple of main reasons for this. Uh, one, the Lunar South Pole has been mostly unexplored in previous missions, and it is also suspected to be rich in natural resources, um, mainly uh, 600 million metric tons of water ice. So. I can uh mm, yeah we're on the background slide. Mm, so uh well the background here uh so we had uh there are a couple of problems on the moon there's limited uh, available light uh so some areas um mm, sorry okay so some areas of the moon they um uh they don't receive a uh, sunlight uh, all the time so there's also some hazardous terrain and uh navigation is difficult. So um, uh, depending on the location that you are on the moon, uh, you get different amounts of light. So could you go to the next slide? Okay, so this is okay. um, our solution to the problem. Um, so it is a portable device that emits bright periodic light from four LEDs that are mounted on its base. Um, as you can see on the top of the base, there is a solar panel that rotates on two axes to maximize the sunlight absorbed. Um, and then, and uh, go ahead. Sorry for being late. Yeah, we have a lot of problems. I'm sorry. Or we work through it. Let's keep going. OK, um, and then so inside the base um, are enclosed all of the electrical components, such as the Arduino battery, et cetera. OK, so now here are our deliverables. So for we had a couple of prototypes, a uh, smaller one and then our this final larger one. So this is our final deliverable. We wanted it uh, to be self-sustaining, uh, self-sustaining device capable of producing uh, bright periodic uh, illumination on whether it is uh, the lunar day or the lunar night, which, uh, as I was stating before, um, it's not exactly on the on the moon. It's not exactly like on Earth. You can, depending on the region where you are, you can have um, a couple of days full of sunlight or a couple of days full of uh, darkness. So some of those primary objectives that we wanted to reach was to make it self-sustaining, uh, as in um, no matter where you, no matter where, which pole or the equator that you are on the moon, um, it will uh, be able to absorb all the solar energy and then throughout the darkness uh, still be able to flash. And so overall self-sustaining to make it bright, the LEDs are around a mile away to still be able to be seen and to make it pretty, somewhat small uh, and lightweight. Next slide. Okay. And now the engineering specs. So uh, all these, the three main energy consumers and the en energy producers, this, it would be from the solar panel, the battery and the LEDs, right? So they're all uh, synchronized for each other, meaning they all take a uh, 12 volt now the max power for the solar panel is says 25 watts but uh we presume uh, around the uh we may be able to take around 15 watts now the battery uh that uh, has a capacity of nine amp hours 12 uh, volts 
So really, if we're using one amp, it should be able to give out enough power for nine hours. And that's what the LEDs are using. It's four of them. On average, they're using one amp and a uh, uh, 13 watt. And so uh, if they're using one amp on average, it should be able to uh, last for uh, nine hours. Okay, next slide. And now here is the circuit schematic. Uh, so here's the circuit schematic where we have uh, the charge controller um, uh, managing the solar panel, the battery and the LEDs. Right, and hooked up next to the batteries, that would be where the Arduino on motors and anything, et cetera, would be uh, powered through also. So the charge controller, that keeps track that not too much power is being fed elsewhere, maybe if there's like a short circuit or something somewhere, and that the battery won't discharge itself onto the solar panel itself either. Next slide. As you can see from our grant chart, uh, we were actually very excited to accomplish all our project goals. We were uh, guided to treat this project as a real uh, life project that also include a small and cost efficient uh, version of it. Uh, and as you can see in task number three, we designed a small demo prototype uh, that will be used as a proof of concept before we move on to the big prototype. Uh, after um, we were able to do the proof of concept, we moved into the big project task number four and five. Uh, in a short time frame, we so in a short time frame and uh, other responsibilities, we were able to achieve all our project goals and present to you the project that we're very proud of. Uh, next slide, please. Here we can see the small demo prototype that uh, uh, we took and did in task number three that I just mentioned. We can see clearly how the photoresistors are, uh, is rotate with respect to the LED light, but there is also there is a lot behind that. Uh, we also had two rotors that uh, able to rotate the solar panel to all access uh, directions and also a smart Arduino code that control the whole system. Next slide, please. Here we can see a very important section of our final project. The 3D part that were designed for this project had a very uh, accurate, had to be very accurate, ac accurate, sorry, had to be able to uh, uh, make the two gears 3D parts to rotate together. Uh, and on the left hand side, we can see the 3D part in real life after we print it uh, combined together as one. Next slide. So here is the pseudocode for sunlight tracker. So the way it works is it first collects sunlight data from the photoresistor. And if the left, left sensor value is less than right sensor value, it adjusts the motor angle. But if the right sensor value is less than left sensor value, it reverses the polarity of motor and adjusts angle. Uh, kind of the flowchart is collecting data, collecting input from the photoresistor and outputting uh, outputting to the motor based on that. Uh, next slide. So here is uh, the Arduino Nano connection that we have. So in the analog, uh, we take it as input for four photoresistors. So we took four photoresistors as an input for analog. And based on that, we produce digital output for LEDs and motors. So we have motors like uh, work on based on the input from the photoresistors. And we also have one of the LED pin uh, so that we can uh, Blink the LED uh, periodically using the MOSFET. Uh, next slide. So here is the final design of our project. So we have a water resistant box with four LEDs on each side of it. Uh, we were able to eliminate the need of PCB because our solar panel was water resistant and the battery and the breadboard was protected by the water resistant uh, box. So uh, uh, that's it. Next slide. OK, so here we have a demo we'd like to show you guys of our final design in action. And here we go. Yes, as you can see, we have our LEDs that's on the, all four sides of it. 
blinking periodically as we determine that they should be. We have our solar tracker that's tracking the sun. As you can see in the panel is at an angle sufficient enough to catch the sunlight sensor data or sunlight data, I'm sorry. And our PV value right here on the charge controller is shown four volts, which is where we expect it to be at. And it should show the battery voltage also in a second. There you go. Also about 12.3 volts. Uh, next slide. And so uh, during the course of this project, we had a few setbacks that we would like to mention. And when we were twisting the, uh, or we were thinking about how the solar tracker would be twisting the panel in order to track the sun, we had to realize that uh, our cables that are connecting to the to the photoresistors, so the motors and so the um, so the panels themselves would get caught in this twisting if you go 360 degrees and you keep going. So we had the uh, we luckily we had the use of this these twisting cables, these special 360 degree uh, rotation, and allowed us to do what it sounds like just spin 360 degrees without having to worry about being tangled. And so there was also a problem with torque um, due to the weight of, of the solar panel being too much for our original 3D part that we had. And so we ended up having to order another hollow uh, aluminum rod that was the same diameter as our other 3D piece that we had. But um, but the aluminum rod was basically to, to, to support the weight, right? And so wires were fed through this and to the box below. Uh, the connection between the aluminum rod and top gear was still not stable and it had to be reinforced, which is what we did. And unfortunately, as what goes with some projects sometimes, we uh, ended up breaking the solar panel at the last minute. Uh, but with all projects, you, uh, the project has to continue, right? And, mis and we also had seen that there was some misalignment with the 3D printed gears at first. Next slide. And so in summary, we built a fully functional prototype that would met our desired specifications that it had to be bright, lightweight, and most of all, so self-sustaining. Uh, we troubleshooted issues and we had difficulty along the way. Uh, and we reached our stretched goal. Next slide. So and so there are like three, there there are three main important lessons I say we learned over the course of this project. And that there were number one, there will always be unforeseen issues that cannot be planned for, right? Such as our the fact that we had to resize our 3D printed components. Uh, we couldn't really see that in the future until we actually started building the project itself. Uh, two, there are various technical research and report skills that we learned, uh, such as oral presentations and writing written reports, uh, patent search, and the importance of doing so. Risk management, budgeting, budgeting, scheduling, and number three, uh, we learned good team, team communication skills and how to how to juggle how to juggle each other's schedules. Sorry, because uh, we had either miscommunication or nobody was available, or we had to know how to delegate tasks, and so that's why over the course of this project, it, it taught us good project management and team communication skills. Next slide. So here are the improvements that future teams can make on our project. One of them, number one, vertical sun tracking with maximum rotation limit so that we don't, uh, so that the weight of solar panel doesn't uh, damage our 3D parts. Uh, the re realization of vapor circuit onto a PCB, uh, enhancing the pro portability and deployment of the device. And if there is no enough sunlight, sun, sunlight, for example, in cloudy condition, tracking the uh, sun position based on GPS, uh, lat latitude and longitude, and using our sunlight sensor instead of photoresistors, uh, because photoresistors sometimes confuse other light as the source of light and it move the motor accordingly. So to differentiate that, it would be good to have sunlight sensors. And currently our our device need to be plugged into battery, so it would be good to have one of the on off switch at the outside of the box for easy access. Uh, next slide, please. OK, thank you. Uh, first, let me thank apologize you. to everyone. Uh, Brian, uh, 
who else do we have on the industry advisory board? Do you want to be the first one to start giving the feedback to students? Sure. Uh, we also have uh, I saw Blake Savoy on the on the in the chat. I didn't see the rest. I may have missed them coming in. Um, but they they can. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. it was just me and Blake for now. OK, go ahead. Yeah, so. Awesome work, guys. Uh, very interesting uh, project, right? NASA's Artemis uh, actually consulted for them uh, to help them to develop their lunar grid standards. Um, emphasis on standards, right? NASA does have technical standards that anything they send out to space needs to meet, right? Uh, did you work with a NASA liaison or was there someone to guide you? on what questions to ask, right? Because, you know, this is essentially a solar tracking 3D print project, right? You know, there's no technical standard mentioned in the, in the project where, okay, it's gonna meet this radioactive, you know, standard. It's gonna meet, um, you know, what, what standards are you meeting, right? Um, what literature review, what literature review was performed? Right. I, I think one thing was that was mentioned was patent search. Um, but just a literature review of the standards, right? Who is your client? NASA, right? What standards do they need you to meet? Uh, NS, I think it's called NTSS, NASA Technical Standards, uh, something, right? There's power quality standards. There's electro electronics standards that the, that you need to meet, right? Um, I would have liked to see that in this project. Um, but right. So, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say so, uh, to answer your first question. Um, so we didn't, um, actually consult with anyone at NASA. Um, so this is a continuation project that we kind of, um, just took and, um, decided to make a kind of a proof of concept because um, initially we were trying to reach um, a certain brightness requirement based off of the original design challenge put out by NASA. Um, but we realized that it actually wouldn't be possible to produce that many lumens without going way over budget. Um, so once we realized that, we decided to um, kind of just make this like a pow like a proof of concept um, and try to meet the, you know, the self-sustaining and then try to make it as small as possible while also staying within budget. So we we're yes. kind of uh, looking at these different like trade-offs. Um, so but you answered knowing... my second question. Oh. Which is okay. why did you 3D print in the first place, right? Are there not existing mm -hmm. equipment out there that you could just buy and set this up together? So, you know, if, you know, what's the customer asking for, right? What's the standard that you need to meet? Okay, I would have liked to see that. The failures is good to show too, right? Um, you know, this is what they were expecting, but we couldn't meet that because in order to meet this, we needed to have this level of precision in our equipment. We needed to buy $500 gears or something, right? Right. Uh, I, th I think, uh, excuse me, uh, two semesters ago, when we just started the project, when we had to choose which project we want to do, uh, we got a link to NASA website uh, that showing a very brief and very short spe uh, uh, specification, sorry for my English, that showing what they want. Like, if I'm not mistaken, I need to check it out and I will be get back to you. Uh, they require a certain luminous flux through the LED, uh, stuff like this, very, very basic, uh, because they know it's going to uh, senior design at the university. But I will be happy to answer your question in a more professional way and actually look for this link and get back to you because it's an important question. Yeah, just for your future. Uh, work, right? the, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, you know, in, once you're out there in the field actually working, right, you need to, you know, don't don't just have a customer tell you, hey, I want X, Y, Z. You need to be able to tell the customer, well, if you do X, Y, Z, you're not going to meet the standards. 
right? Oh, you know, you're not going to you're not going to get approved for a permit in the city of Houston, right? You need to know what standards you need. You can't just have a customer tell you what to do and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, now that uh, I remember correctly, I believe. Yeah, what UV was talking about the paper from NASA, <laughs> and uh, that we had uh downloaded. Um, yeah, and we were talking uh to um our uh our semester one um uh a professor and so then and she was saying for the amount of the luminous flux that they uh, wanted so they uh, nasa in the paper they had stated for it to be like anywhere uh, on the moon and uh for some places um like the equator and uh, the poles is different i believe it was on the poles that you get um 13 days of sunlight and 13 days of nighttime so on uh, other places where you get like, uh, I believe it was like one day of sunlight and one day of night, that was okay. Like uh, the battery size uh, for nighttime, you have to have a certain battery size to power the LEDs with that much uh, luminosity, that much light. But for the, um, yeah, the, the poles, I remember for 13 days of darkness, for the battery to be able to give out one amp, like that much power, I remember I, I was kind of more the calculation uh, for the power guy. And um, um, we needed around uh, three car battery sizes of the lithium ion, the, the lithium ion technology. The, that's the, the best battery types out there. And yeah, that was just um, uh, not, not practical. So then uh, she had told us to, uh, well, let's, uh, we can lower the brightness a bit or we can make it not, immediately flash for a whole third of uh, the flashing or the LEDs on for a whole 13 days. But uh, yeah, I believe, yeah, what Yubi was talking about, there were some of uh, uh, the, the requirements from NASA. Um, I don't believe their website uh, has it uh, anymore on there. Uh, but uh, it, yeah, those uh, our professor, she told us we could work around uh, some of those. Yeah. Okay, I would have liked to see that. Yeah, I think is Doug here in the break? Yes, I saw Doug come in now. Right. Doug, Mr. Lee, I will do my best to, to get back to you with your question. I, I will get your email after this if it's okay with you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I didn't do a good job keeping time. I know we're over 20 minutes already, but I would like to let the other board uh, uh, IAB members uh, uh, ask a question here. Hi, uh, yes. So. Uh, quickly, this is Blake. Um, so I, I think overall, you, you guys did a, a really great job. Um, I think you you did well at describing uh, the the concepts of the project, and I, I think you did really well with covering the technical side, um, really getting into the details of uh, the technical aspects of the project. Um, but just like Brian mentioned. Uh, where you could have really uh, made some improvement would be to make a connection for um, what you did and um, why you did it and make that connection to standards that you were trying to meet. So that was uh, the, the the thing that was lacking, just like Brian mentioned, was uh, the standards. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I think you guys did a, a really good job. And I, I've been, pretty, I'm, I'm always pretty critical in my in my critiques, but you, you guys did great, really. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. I guess uh, we move on to the next team. Um, I have my yeah. notes already, so I'll have my reviews. I'll do my reviews after. OK. Thank you for having um, us, guys. Bye bye. OK, thank you. The next team, when the next team coming up, let me comment, uh, partially respond to the question from the IP members. Um, I think we have a hard time to find sponsors who can really guide the students. Uh, last semester, we have a project for NASA. Actually, we have a very responsive uh, sponsor. So I actually went out to GSC to review the project. Um, 
on one on the other hand, this is lacking the prototype. It doesn't have they may not have the capability to meet all the standards. But I think there's something that uh, we did touch, but did not push high enough. Uh, they need to understand what are the standards. They can say we don't have the budget, we don't have the time, we don't have the capability to meet all those standards. But I think I should be doing a better job to let them find out what those standards are. OK, next team, team three, go ahead. Uh, can you guys hear me well first? Yes. yes. OK, all right. Hi, everyone. We are team three, and our project is the Smart Trip Irrigation System. Uh, this is a continuation project that has been going on since 2017, and we are working on the final iterations of this project, or worked, at, worked on the final iterations of this project, focusing on corrosion mitigation, heat dissipation, and design modularity. My name is Kevin Patel. I'm joined by our team leader, Mohamed Kasif, Saad Rodriguez, and Jia King Du. Our project manager is Dr. Pei, and our faculty advisor is Dr. Trimbetto. Next slide, please. I think it's fundamental to first start off with the problem that we're trying to tackle with our project. Um, so currently in Nicaragua, it's one of the poorest countries in Latin America, um, suffering from food deficits and just poverty in general. And this can be directly related to the practice of agriculture, which occupies 70% of the population, but is just inefficient. And the reason for that is uh, due to the erratic climate in Nicaragua, um, prominent, um, prominently in the south and west part of Nicaragua. Um, and what the reason for that is because of these um, El Nino phenomenon that's happening in the region that's creating these dry corridor areas uh, and reducing the rainfall totals that these farmers usually see. Many of these farmers are heavily reliant on these rainfall totals and there isn't a lot of access to smart um, smart drip irrigation technology. Uh, therefore, we see a lot of opportunity to help these farmers out by reducing reliance on uh, rainfall totals and increasing crop efficiency. Next slide. So again, our purpose is to develop a smart drip irrigation system that can help address this issue with crop productivity um, by reducing reliance on rainfall totals. Uh, we are working with the collaboration of IEEE, uh, BioNICA, and the University of Akrodad. I probably butchered the name, but I'm trying my best. But our iteration of project will focus on, you know, um, like the previous downfalls of previous teams, uh, which is uh, the elimination of corrosion on wiring and moisture level sensors. Um, cooling for heat dissipation. Uh, again, we're talking about Nicaragua where you're seeing temperatures upwards of 100 and extreme humidity, and then also doing a power analysis and modularity of design for consumer use. Next slide, please. Um, so our users are directly um, related to the small scale farmers in Nicaragua. We are working with BioNICA and the University of Africa, um to uh, you know, work with these farmers and get their input into the design of this um, project, uh, making sure whatever we, whatever they want, we can you know, actually do. Um, so I think it's pr um, pretty important to you know, talk about the users themselves, right? These farmers have very low income. Again, they're not uh, getting a lot of money from their crop productivity. Uh, they have little technical experience, um, so making sure that our design is very durable and modular. Uh, furthermore, conservation of water. Um, water is not going to be provided endless in an endless supply. It's actually um, provided by a um, water tank that's raised about 10 feet above ground. Um, you know, and then also, you know, general standards like environmental impact, right? Nicaragua is a very beautiful country. Uh, we want to make sure that we preserve it with our um, with our system. So making sure like things like we don't introduce lead from our valves into the irrigation hoses and into the um, ground itself is something that well, we will focus on. Um, next slide, please. OK, so our overview diagrams have been split up into a hardware and software overview uh, to show how our smart drip irrigation system works all together. So to get started, I included numbers on the arrows of the hardware overview so that anyone can look at it on their own and follow along, but I will explain it for the presentation. Basically, the system begins with um, the solar panels because that is how energy is gathered. Then that is passed through the charge controller to charge the rechargeable battery. The rechargeable battery is used to power the microcontroller and the temperature controller board, and this can take you down two paths in functionality of our system, and I'll begin with the microcontroller path. So once the microcontroller is powered, the motion sensors send its data to the microcontroller, which displays a percentage on the display to show how wet the sensors are. If the soil is dry, the microcontroller will trigger the moisture, the motorized valves to open so that water is released through the irrigation hose, uh, which will water the farmland and the farm, 
farmland will be used to gather data about the soil's uh, moisture. The cycle will repeat, and if the soil is wet, the microcontroller will be triggered um, to turn off the, to close the motorized valves. Uh, now going back to the temperature controller board, this is the part of the cooling system that we have added um, for our iteration of the project. Uh, once it's powered on, the user will be able to set a temperature using the buttons on the board to trigger the fan to turn on or off uh, based, on the, based on this uh, set temperature. Uh, and that's essentially how the hardware of our system works. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, in terms of our software overview, this explains how our micro microcontroller is working with the hardware of our system. Uh, we begin with the data from the moisture sensors. The moisture sensors send uh, the data to the microcontroller, which will determine if the soil has low or high saturation. If it has high saturation, then the system will loop back around to the moisture sensors until the soil has low saturation. If the soil has low saturation to begin with, the system will check the internal clock to see if it is daytime or nighttime. If it is daytime, it will loop back around until it is nighttime for the sake of preserving water. If it is nighttime, the timer will begin and the valves will open as long as the timer hasn't run out. Once the time expires, the valves will close and we will loop back around to the moisture sensors to check if our soil has low or high saturation. And that is uh, the logic being used uh, for the main functionality of our microcontroller. Next slide. Uh, now, when it comes to our deliverables, we are going to deliver an autom autonomous smart drip irrigation system that will function for two plots of land uh, using five moisture sensors and one valve per crop of land to increase the accuracy of the watering needed. Additionally, we will deliver an intuitive interface that can control the water levels needed based on the crop that is being watered. Uh, lastly, we have Im implemented a cooling system to protect the longevity of the electronics and we have updated the moisture sensors to prevent corrosion down the line. Next slide. So on to product features and general specifications. So we'll be having a LCD for viewing important system, system operation data, such as the moisture sensor values and valve position. This is part of the HMI, so it also includes the three buttons that we'll get into in the next slide. Um, the system is outdoor installation ready, meaning as a back frame pre reeled mounting, ready to be mounted on a wall or something. Um, also, the junction box is uh, made out of high quality uh, ABS plastic, shock resistant, it's, uh, dust proof, so it should be ready for the harsh Nicaraguan conditions. We're using a 12 volt, 7.2 amp hour battery that should get the unit or keep the unit operational through the night and more. That's being powered by a 100 watt uh, solar panel uh, to charge the battery during the daytime. Inside the unit, we have conformally coated all the electronics for uh, corrosion mitigation and heat dissipation because we knew we know a uh, issue they had in previous units was that the electronics were corroding over time. Another thing they needed was nighttime watering. And that's a feature we we have in our unit because daytime watering, the harsh conditions in Nicaragua, the water would uh, evaporate by the time it really reached the soil. And that's also uh, an issue we're dealing with, which is cooling. That's why I have an active cooling system, which includes the DC fan, uh, an adjustable temperature trigger, which will turn on and off the fan depending on the, the temperature inside the unit uh, that's being read by a thermal probe. And um, the fan is exhausting the air out by the help of a rain shroud to make sure water doesn't come in back into the unit. And as mentioned earlier, we'll have two valves, 10 sensors to uh, get two, two plots aligned. So uh, here's a short uh, walkthrough of the menu and what we did. So as you can see here, there's the LCD display. We have multiple buttons up or three buttons up, down and enter. Once you turn it on, you'll get to the main display. We'll get to that in the next slide. 
But when you get to the main menu, you'll have valve setting. You can edit the crop values and set a time or schedule, or you can go back to the main menu. But the first menu, valve settings, you can choose which valve you're working with. And from there, you can either enable or disable the valve or choose the certain crop um, you're planting in that field. And you can go back, you can edit the crop value. So here you can edit the threshold value for each individual crop. So we have them all set at 80%, but they can set at any threshold value. And you can also set time, you can enable or disable the schedule for nighttime watering, or you can, or when it's enabled, you can set what times the, the unit is operational during the night. And you can also set a current time for whatever, whatever time it is. Okay, on to the valve functionality. So as you can see here, the first line will tell you the, okay, the time and date. Second line, battery will tell you if it's in battery saving mode or not. To the right, that's the current temperature. And the SD stands for schedule disabled. If it's SE means the schedule is enabled. Then you have the uh, moisture level values for each, for the grouping of five sensors. You have group, group one, group two. Then you have a valve status. Right now, as you can see, we're both set at open, and that means the valves are open because it's dry. In the background, you'll see us putting the moisture sensors in water, which will close the valves. And as you can see here, um, the sensor percentages are both over 80%. That's why they closed. And you can see the valve status both at C, meaning the valves are closed. Oops. So, oh, we did have some setback. <coughs> set, excuse me. <coughs> we did have some setbacks. Firstly, the uh, defective of the PCB board. Uh, when wiring directly to our microcontroller, our electronics uh, functioned properly. Mm -hmm. But when wiring to the PCB board, we were having problems with our electronics. That caused our team to reach out the company that produced our board and to get a new one ordered and delivered, which ultimately delayed our process in the wiring of our electronics. Second is our original board lacks documentation, the malfunctioning board, and the glitches in the development environment used for the board. Um, our team decided to switch up the old TI launchpad to Arduino. That caused a major delay. We had to spend time writing code, understanding a new development environment, and uh, creating a new schematic uh, for the wiring of our new board. But finally, our team overcame these difficulties. Next slide. So during these two semesters, in terms of software skills, we learned adaptability, delicate tasks, and uh, uh, product uh, life, life cycle and time management. In terms of technical takeaways, we learned microprocessor coding, PCB design, uh, hardware testing, and 3D printing. And most importantly, our team learned never to give up and to be brave enough to face new devices and new challenges. Next page. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Any questions? Uh, you, want to answer, you want to answer this one? Yeah, Brian, yeah. why don't you go ahead? Doug, you still on the call? Oh, uh, yeah, yes, I'm here. Oh, sorry, you, you wanted me to go first? Well, Doug, Doug Varick, he's not on the call. Doug was, I think, Brian, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, as with the rest of the other presentation, right, um, I love the 
the purpose of this project, right? You know, it's actually going to somewhere. Um, but again, uh, I would like to see what new, like you, you get an existing project, right? And you make some tweaks, you make some adjustments, but uh, what standards, again, are you trying to meet or exceed that the previous one didn't meet or exceed, right? You talked about waterproof, right? The corrosion of the electronics, right? Um, okay, what is how, what standards of waterproofing for electronics are there? I, I was just I just did a quick Google search, right? What's I, IPX5, IPX7? Is your enclosure IP57 rated, right? Um, I would like to see that, right? Just uh, I, I just want the students to have a, a higher understanding of you know standard, right? You know everything. There's a standard for everything, right? And if there's not a standard, there's someone making a standard for it. Um, I would just like to see more literature review, right, um, in that aspect. I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Blake ask. ask oh, or can, if you want to, can I can I respond to that real quick? Hmm? Yeah. So um, we didn't mention this, but uh, we had the previous uh, team's uh, unit in the lab. And before we actually shipped it out to Nicaragua to be used, we actually uh, ran a series of tests. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to go into all the tests, but we did all these tests during the summer. Uh, and one of the tests, for instance, is we did uh, a test um, regarding how much heat the unit can tolerate before it starts to, you know, act up. And uh, we actually, you know, ran a test. We actually put it through a um, an oven in the mechanical engineering lab. Uh, saw that uh, the temperature that the max the maximum temperature that this unit previous unit could operate at is 150 degrees of um, Fahrenheit. Uh, and we consider that to be our breakpoint temperature. Uh, so when we designed our own, you know, product, we made sure that, hey, when we put in our fan, can our, you know, can our thermal probe make, can our thermal system make sure that uh, our unit does not exceed that temperature? Otherwise, you know, components such as the charge controller, which is the first um, component that failed in the previous team's unit, um, mm -hmm. At 150 degrees would not happen in our own unit. So we kind of did these tests along the summer. We did tests involving um, the corrosion mitigation of the sensors, like putting it through soil, alluvial soil that you find in Nicaragua with a uh, certain pH level and see how long they can last. And we found out that the previous capacitive sensor that the previous team was using, um, to be honest, it only lasted a week before it stopped functioning. Uh, that's why we upgraded our sensor. So like things like that, we we actually had done. I think, you know, to be honest, I think all of our specs directly came from those tests and what the farmers had said um, previously. Um, so, I mean, I hope that kind of helps answer that question a little bit that you had, Brian. Well, and that's not too different from how people create standards, right? I, mm -hmm. there, I just want to see a literature review, right? Because um, okay. there's there's some standards that there's not there's not there's not even a standard yet, right? But you can see all the literature review on how they're still trying to develop the standard, right? Um, because that's where the edge uh, state of the art is, right? How do you exceed standards, right? Um, how do you make them more common, right? Um, anyway, no, that, this is really good. Um, really good job, guys. Greg, any question, comments? Yes, I have a couple of things. Um, yeah, again, I, I think you guys did a really great job overall. Uh, nice job with your uh, presenting and your presentation material. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of things. Uh, so with the fan, uh, it's, it's easy to understand the concept of the relationship of controlling the moisture with the valve. Uh, but I, I would I would have liked to see you guys elaborate more on the fan and the fan control and the purpose and how that works. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I, I would like to know I, I'd like to see more data on the ideal moisture setting and some kind of a relationship um, to the moisture setting and uh, the gallons of water consumed. Okay, anything else? Is Doug back here? Doug was here earlier. We lost Doug. Did we? I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, Doug. 
Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, I can't hear any of the speakers. The only person I can hear is you. Okay, Doug, you you must be still in the teen uh, in at the at the Zoom, right? Yes, I am. Okay, I just sent you the link to the team. Can you join us here at the team? Well, I tried that a minute ago and it wouldn't let me in, but I'll try it again. Try again, because I think I watched that. I, I might have missed that to let you in. Okay, I'll try, I'm gonna, let me log out of it and I'll, I'll try logging in again, but please proceed. Don't wait for me. I wanna. Okay. I won't let let me respond to the recurring question from Brian. I think that last semester when I asked a student to do the pattern search, every member also have to report its standards related to their project. I, I didn't do it this semester. I think I'm going to repeat it again in the future. Doug, I don't see your... I have one other question. Uh, in terms of water quality, what are y'all trying to achieve? Or is it just, you know, just take what you get? Just connecting. Can you hear me? I cannot see your request to be connected here. Who is the owner of the team? Uh, everyone should be able to approve anyone to get in. I get a message that says, sorry, we couldn't connect you. I didn't see the request to join from you for some reason. Uh, oh, OK, I just clicked it, though. I just clicked the one that you sent me. OK. So, want me to try it again? Please. Hey, Doug, we try uh, let him know I updated the industry representative meeting invite to have the new link, so if you can try that. We could just go back to the Zoom. Okay. okay. In we the interim, just... in the interim, why team one? Why don't you take over the screen? What's that? Yes. Yes, sir. Team three, would you remove your slides and let team one take over the screen? Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Team one, you may share your screen. Currently on it right now. Are y'all able to see my screen right now? Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Why don't you get started? All good. All righty. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are Team One. My name is Jose Arjon. My name is Kayla Antartas. I'm Samir Ahmad. No, I'm, I'm John Zachary Gomez. Gomez. And I'm Zachary Laquang. And this is our Smart Cane final presentation. So a little background. Today, roughly over 1 million people in the US suffer from blindness, and it is predicted to double by the year 2050. The fact is, as this number grows, more and more people will have to depend on the white cane. With this increase also comes the increase of the number of head level obstacles these users will encounter. Although blindness is something that we haven't found a cure for yet, Team One hopes we can tackle this issue of white cane users encountering head level injuries by modernizing the white cane and improving the quality of life for its users. Our solution, the smart cane. In this image, you can see our initial design uh, for the smart cane. Our cane's biggest goal is to use the sensor mounted at the base of the handle. I'm sorry, a message popped up in the bottom corner. Um, uh, the, uh, our cane's biggest goal is to use the sensor mounted to the base of the handle to detect incoming obstacles located above the abdomen. We'll speak more in depth on how later in this presentation, but essentially the sensor will provide feedback to the microprocessor, which would then take this information and output through one of our tactile feedback devices integrated into the cane. So this is our smart cane overview diagram. Um, towards the front of the handle, we integrated a time of flight sensor to detect low hanging objects. And the power button is placed on the lid of the chassis to easily power the cane on or off. This will allow the user to turn off the cane when they're idle to conserve the battery life. And 
There are two vibration motors housed inside the handle so that the user can be haptically notified of potential obstacles. Towards the back of the handle is where the chassis houses the microcontroller, battery, motor drivers, and buzzer. And this also helps with the weight distribution of the cane so that the center of mass is at the handle, reducing muscle strain on the user's forearms. The handle is, um, the handle is hollow, which reduces the weight of the cane, and the cane itself is made out of aluminum because it's light, rigid, and cost-effective. And these are the CAD designs I made and 3D printed for the smart cane. The top left picture is the main uh, housing, which stores a majority of our hardware, such as the microcontroller, muxes, buzzer, and motor drivers. The second picture is a battery pack holder, which is adhered to the smart cane housing. The third picture is our sensor mount, which attaches to the front of the handle. The fourth picture is the connector, which connects the main housing to the handle of the cane. And the fifth picture is the lid for the housing with a hole made for the power button. And all these drawings were done in Tinkercad and were 3D printed to be implemented on the cane. So when initially designing the cane, we came up with these deliverables that we expected our final build to meet. And our cane is expected to detect head level obstacles within two meters while differentiating between whether an object is to the left, right, or center by using two directional vibration motors. And the haptic feedback will include having the cane handle vibrate once an object is within two meters. Audio feedback through a buzzer will include beeping sound cues when the object is under the one meter range as a form of high priority alerts. An integrated software is used to retrieve sensor readings and send out appropriate audio and haptic feedback. And these are the finalized specs of our smart cane. Some features I like to highlight on is that our cane inhabits a telescoping fixture to account for size adjustments from the range of 30 centimeters to 150 centimeters, and also for portability. Additionally, our cane weighs about 1.2 pounds made out of lightweight aluminum material. The buzzer used for audio feedback outputs sounds at greater than 89 decibels, which is greater for noisy environments. And finally, all electronic components included were chosen to specifically keep our cane uh, cheaper than competitors. Here we have a flowchart about how our smart cane operates. First, you have a battery that powers on the smart cane, which then sends it into an idle state. And then the time of flight sensor kicks on. And if it encounters an object that's less than two meters, it will uh, send our task to send vibrational feedback to the user through the handle. And then it, if it detects an object which is less than one meter, it gives buzzer feedback so the user can audio hear the alert. And for our accomplishments, we designed a prototype smart cane that can detect objects such as a person, a desk, or a chair. It can also detect low hanging objects that are chest level and above, and it gives directional haptic feedback via two motors uh, mounted inside of the handle. And then it has audio alerts to alert users of objects that are less than one meter away via buzzer. And here is our demo video. Are you guys able to hear audio? No. No. No, no I don't think so. Is uh, there a special setting in Teams that I should click on that allows me to share audio? There should be. Yeah. I believe whenever you share the screen, make sure to check include computer sound. Okay. Um let me I'm going to stop sharing it and then reshare it real quick then. Stop sharing, share, include computer sound. I see it right there. OK, perfect. I'm going to restart the video if that's OK with you. Hi, this is team one. All good. And this is our yep. smart cane. Yes. Demo.
so the vibration and the buzzer went off, so I could tell there's something in front of me. And then I could feel something in this direction. And then this direction is clear. So there's a wall. So my ping just went off. I can tell there's something in this direction. And it continues to go off. So I am going to go in here. So we faced three major setbacks when building the cane. The first was the inability to use Bluetooth module to play sound to a user's wearables as we had intended. To work around this, we connected a buzzer module directly to our circuit to provide audio feedback. We integrated it so the user will hear a buzz when an object comes within one meter of them, a distance we considered to be dangerously close. Our second setback was finding a way to provide an optimal angle distance for the sensor. Uh, this would, since this would vary from user to user, our solution was to print mounts at differing angles that could be switched out depending on the height of the user. This would provide a level of customization for each user. The final setback we ran into was the lack of I2C interfaces. The two vibration modules we chose needed to be connected via I2C as well as the distance sensor. However, the microcontroller we were using only had one interface for I2C. To overcome this, we added a multiplexer to switch between the two vibration modules and we switched to using UART communication for the distance sensor. In summary, over the course of two semesters, we designed and created an improved white cane for the visually impaired. Our goal was to prevent injuries above the waist level by providing users with haptic and audio feedback through the use of vibration motors and a buzzer. Our smart cane was able to accurately detect objects within one and a half meters, alert the user to its presence, and provide audio feedback when the obstacle becomes dangerous to close. We overcame a number of setbacks, such as not enough I2C interfaces, unusable Bluetooth, and providing optimal angle. Three lessons were taken away from this project are the importance of testing, the division of labor, and the trial and error are part of the process. Testing became an important part of the project when we decided to place all of our components inside the hollow handle of the cane. We needed to ensure that there were no faulty parts prior to assembly, otherwise it'd be difficult to diagnose and replace a faulty part. Our second lesson, the vision of labor, came when we assigned each member a role that best matched our skill set. We found that the workflow was smoother and tasks were completed more quickly as a result. The final lesson, was learned when we had multiple setbacks throughout the project and had to come up with ways to overcome them. At first, it seemed as though the errors were a negative sign, but we realized it's part of the process and encountering obstacles was normal. Uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Pei, Dr. De La Rosa Paul, and Dr. Lay, and the whole ECE department for their continued support in our project. We would also like to thank the board members who took time out of their day to listen to our presentations. Um, this concludes our presentations, and we would like to ask if there are any questions. Brian, you want to take the lead again? Uh, sure, I guess we got an order going now. Um, Hey, same question. What quality standards do you need to meet to not get sued? You know, some some someone was using your stick, and let's say the the distance sensor. What could go wrong with the distance sensor? And you, what do you need to do to ensure that it doesn't fail? Right? What what thought was what went into that? Again, the answer could just be proof of concept, right? You know, it's a uh, so it's not for market yet, right? But uh, what thought would, again, literature review, I would like to see this ahead of time. So something that we wanted to talk about is uh, weatherproofing the actual device, because you know we intend this to be used in all different types of environments uh, and inclement weathers. So one thing we were actually looking at was uh, waterproofing it. I don't remember the, the standards off the top of my head, but I believe we were, chasing for IPX6 rating, which can uh, survive sustained water streams from any angle, if I remember correctly. And then, uh, so what we were trying to do is make sure that our actual like wiring and electronics, they actually, you know, have a weatherproof seal. So what we were thinking about putting is uh, like seals are all around the lid, any joints we have that we would put seal on them, we would, hydro test the cane to make sure that it's uh, waterproof and we would put a protect protective housing over the sensor and the, the wires just to make sure that not only are they protected from the weather 
uh, they, we don't damage any of the sensitive sensors and they operate, you know, like they're supposed to for a long time. I guess follow up question. What kind of seal do you need to meet IP6, IPX6? Is it uh, is a waste enough? Do you need some sort of like waterproof tape? Is that enough? Uh, I believe it's a like a, it's, I remember the seal I was specifically looking at. Uh, it needed to be heat treated. Uh, that's why we didn't necessarily go with it because uh, uh, our 3D printed parts are made out of plastic. So I, I forgot the material, but it was made out of, but it's basically like a, a, a rubber seal and you heat it up. And as soon as you like uh, press it down it molds into the, uh, into the space and it's sort of like adhesive to kind of Awesome. I, I love that y'all at least put some thought into it. Um, I would I would like to see them in the presentation, right? Don't don't be afraid to showcase where you were uh, where you missed out, right? Um, you know, we could have went with the, to meet this standard. We could have went with this, but this was too expensive. This was the cost. Here's our cost, and we only meet this lower standard, right? Is that good enough for the client? Thank you. Yeah, hi. So, and most likely you wouldn't need an IPX6 because that's a, uh, you know, hose directed or, or pressurized uh, water jets. You know, most likely what you would be exposed to is uh, just rain, which could be probably uh, IPX4. Uh, anyways, that that's a, uh, a good thing to bring up if um, if you could state what rating you were designing to. Um, it, th this was a very interesting concept. I think you guys did an excellent job presenting. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention was the time of flight sensor. Um, you said you used the time of flight sensor, but you didn't explain what that is, why you chose it. Uh, I think it would be really beneficial um, to explain that. And that that was earlier on towards the beginning. John, can you talk a little bit about the uh, sensor? Yeah, so uh, we chose the time of flight sensor because we had worked with the, and spoken to the previous group. Uh, they found faults in using ultrasonic sensor, faults such as it struggles when in a soft environment, um, like the, the sound won't bounce off and come back. So we decided to go with something that was based on laser, which is where we came up with the time of flight sensor. Uh, it's highly accurate, and this one at least is highly customizable. We can have it to change up to four zones of direction, but for this project, we chose to go with two since we only needed the left and the right side. Okay, great. And that was going to be my other question. Uh, was uh, if you know, I, I feel like your presentation should have talked a little bit more about the. Uh, I mean, you did talk about that you have the directional feedback, but how are you sensing? The direction that was going to be another question, but you, you just answered that. So um, this single time of flight sensor gives you up to four zones, but you only use two of those zones. Yes, that's correct. OK, great, thank you. OK, so no more questions from the IEP members. So thank you. Uh, can you so, hear me? Can you hear me, Dr. Peck? Doc, I can hear you. Go ahead. OK, so I finally got in. You know what I had to do? I had to re-download Teams, and it worked. OK, <laughs> so apologize to the team if uh, you already covered this, because I came in late. So apologies if I make you go back over something. Mm -hmm. um, what I was hoping to see was, what did the previous team do, and what exactly you did to improve it? Maybe you covered that. And I missed it, uh, but that would have been a nice thing to to show me if uh, if in fact it wasn't already shown. I liked your uh, your graphics 
and I liked your demo. It, you know, it's nothing like a demo to show you, hey, this thing really works. They're just not making that stuff up. So that was uh, that was good. It was good to see that. Um, what um, what I thought you might improve on is in your products, where your product spec was kind of anemic in terms of listing out the things that a customer might want to have. Like a customer might, might want to know, for example, you know, how long is the battery life, for example, or uh, is it waterproof? Or certainly would, they would want to know what the cost is, and you did put that in there. I'm not sure who would want a stick that's 30 centimeters. Uh, that would be a really short person, a 30 centimeter stick. Uh, and maybe they are such people, but I'm hard, it's hard to imagine that. So I think it would have been he helpful to have a more developed engineering spec. Um, and from a customer's pr perspective, we call that a product spec when you do it from the customer's perspective rather than the engineering perspective. I think that would have been helpful uh, to have that. And also, I didn't hear anything about how you plan to deal with a blind person who is encountering a curb or who's encountering a step down. Uh, did you decide that that's not something you wanted to develop or is that something that you uh, you meant to do, never got around to it? Uh, or was this out of the scope of the project? And if it was out of the scope of the project, then would a blind person really want to use this if you couldn't detect, you know, a hazard like like a step up or a step down? So those are my comments. I hope you find them helpful. Yeah, so Thank you, I, could, oh. Oh, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the length. Uh, the reason why it says 30 centimeters is just to show that it can go down to that length in case you want to put it in a bag. Uh, or anything like that, just for transport purposes, because you know you can't be walking around with a hundred fifty long uh, centimeter long stick all the time. And then uh, for curb, uh, I don't know if you see the ball at the end, but I believe that's uh, made for the scoping at the ground. So if they were to come across uh, a curb or anything, the ball would roll off and it would stop giving them like you know the the smooth motion that that cane gives when you're rolling on that ball. So that's uh, just the indicator that uh, it could show that there's a curb there. Uh, the main scope of work was just low hanging objects because that that's what causes most of the injuries. If we needed to do anything that was below uh, the torso level, we would need another sensor that would be pointing down so that could actually detect all of that. Yeah, those are those are good points, Samir. Yeah, so essentially this cane before we decided to upgrade it and it was just a regular uh, telescoping cane. So typically any any blind person could have ordered this from Amazon and they would be able to use the cane. So the cane still has its basic functionalities. So people uh, that are visually impaired can sweep side to side, like Samir said, to detect low uh, like ground level obstacles like a curb or stair steps coming up and down. Um, so essentially we what we did was um, to uh, enhance it with these sensors and the buzzer and uh, motors to uh, give the user a wider range of information that they can now uh, understand just by only using their cane. And another okay. thing that um, the past group did in the past was uh, I don't think you were here for this, but it was a John mentioned it before. The other team used a different sensor that would dampen based on like sound, so that had issues detecting certain objects. So we chose to use a time of flight sensor since it's uh, I believe it's a lidar sensor, so it's more direct. And then another thing that the past group used was a speaker. They integrated that into the cane, but that added more weight than what a buzzer would. And we found that using a buzzer could achieve the same results as using a speaker. So we just went with the buzzer to minimize weight on the cane. OK, so those are good answers. Thank you. Uh, I, does, I, I was looking for something more complete, though, than just uh, the one item having to do with the sonar versus the time of flight. But, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I thank you very much for your answers. Very thank you very good. much. If there's no more question from IAB members, Team 7, you may take over the screen.
Thank you. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Go ahead. Sorry about this. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Xavier Garcia, and I am the team lead for the Internet of Things Brain Node. Uh, joining me today are my teammates, Zach Mir, Mario Blanco, St. Giget, and Neuroscience. Our project sponsor is Dr. Contreras, and our project manager is Dr. Stephen Pei. Uh, there are about 1 billion people in the world living with a disability, and 20% of those people suffer from a form of paralysis. While most devices are designed with accessibility in mind, they may still not be as completely as accessible as some people need or want. For example, phones and some other network devices are not that accessible for people that are paralyzed, for people that are disabled in some other way, or even for elderly with mobility issues. Uh, furthermore, for people that are unable to reliably move or speak coherently, there is no other way to communicate with the smartphone or other devices, such as hospital equipment or home appliances. Uh, to address the disadvantages and issues presented, we are developing a smartphone application that communicates with a relatively low-cost Muse EEG headset in order, in order to use brain waves to control the smartphone, and hopefully other network, networked devices that are connected to the smartphone and the local area network. Uh, we have trained and implemented a machine learning model that will allow us to classify eye blinks and jaw clenches in, in order to implement a simple control system on the smartphone. Thus, the inputs to the control system are simply eye blinks and jaw clenches. Uh, a few example controls include calling a specific number or person, sending a pre-written text, opening and controlling some of their applications and smart home connected appliances, or alerting someone or signaling for help. The deliverables for our product include an EG software that provides disabled people with access to modern smartphones using a combination of eye blinks and jaw clenches to perform various predefined actions. Our EEG software is comprised of a mobile Android app for users to interface with and a machine learning model backend that classifies our EEG data from the Muse headset. We have also created an established uh, communication link between our low cost Muse headset and our Android environment. The specs of our product include being able to perform commands with 90% accuracy and being compatible with uh, Android 8 and above, which uh, accounts for 88.2% of all Android devices. The features of our product include uh, being able to create custom actions based on the combination of uh, eye blinks and jaw clenching motions and having real time EEG visualization on our application. Our uh, development tasks include uh, creating a connectivity layer between the low cost Muse headset and our mobile application, uh, developing our machine learning model backend using uh, K nearest neighbor algorithms, and the front end development of our Android app using Android Studio. Each task in our project development consists of a set of test plans that, uh, to ensure the project is working as intended. Uh, task one, test plan include testing Bluetooth connectivity to Windows PC, uh, unit testing lab streaming layer pub uh, sub model, and continuous communication between Muse, computer, and the smartphone. For the machine learning prediction task, um, the task includes building confusion matrix, calculating accuracy from correct prediction over all predictions, um, calculating pr uh, precision by calculating true positives over sum of all positives, uh, and <clears throat> testing for model fitting and learning and uh, testing learning curves. Uh, as for the app performance, our testing includes manual feature testing with uh, unit testing for each feature that we include, uh, testing the app in multiple devices, and also testing the app in different version of Android. Um, <clears throat> to reiterate, our product will use the EEG headset and a smartphone to allow people with disabilities or in uh, hospitals more access to their phone and uh, and some devices around them. So to do that, we will create the missing communication link uh, between the Android environment and the Muse headset to access the EEG signal from our brain. Uh, and then we will display the signal to verify a good connection has been made uh, and then process the signal so that it may be used in a machine learning model to uh, identify eye blinks and jaw clench patterns to uh, realize an easy to use mobile control system. 
Finally, for robustness, a command verification window will pop up, which will require a user to uh, blink twice to verify that the, to verify that the previously inputted command uh, sequence is correct. For the machine learning model, uh, we collected a set of data from each member of the team using the Muse headset, uh, and we separated the data collection to different event groups we are interested in. So, for example, um, for the double eye blink, uh, each member of the team uh, went went and uh, collected that data, and then after we were finished with that, we went to jaw clench, eye blink, uh, left eye blink, and right eye blink. And as as we were doing that, we also recorded ourselves so that we may be able to look back and pinpoint exactly where it is that each event occurred. So for the machine learning uh, model training, um, so what we had to do was record ourselves uh, via video. And then uh, from the incoming information from the Muse, we had to line up the action of a jaw clinch, eye blink, right eye blink, left eye blink, and double eye blink. Um, as you can see from this Excel file, uh, you can see the instance on which it had occurred coming in from the Muse uh, sequence uh, 1,365 uh, for the first double eye blink. And we lined it up with the exact time on the YouTube video. So for the pre-processing of the data, uh, we had to uh, collect the incoming UDP packets, uh, concatenate the sequential data and separate them into five different channels. Uh, from there, we had to normalize the data by calculating the mean of every 10 elements uh, without, repeating any, without repeating any elements uh, to be fed into the machine learning training model. And the algorithm that we used was the nearest K, nearest K uh, neighbor algorithm, uh, which essentially uh, we had to set up a constant K in which we had an ideal value of what um, classified the data. So from there, we had to measure the distance from the ideal value to determine whether it would be, uh, as you can see in this example right here, uh, class A or class B uh, based on the distance. So this is how we actually implemented the machine learning model. So we took the the Mario's double eye blink. We took the sequence number. Each sequence has four channels, as we do, like talked about, and it actually concatenated all all four, 30 channels in in a straight like array, with keeping the placement of the each of those channels at like aligned. So that create gave gave us 120 features to be put into the KNS member model. And that like a model has five outputs: double eye blink, left jaw clinches, left eye blink, right eye blink, and 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 another class for doing nothing. As the model was trained, the, that was implemented later on. So this, in, in order to implement, we created a rolling window of thirty elements. So. Uh, a rolling window is a window of 30 elements that is going to be keep rolling each element one but one after another and so the data came concatenated and did the, all the pre-processing and then we created a rolling window of 30 elements the 30 elements which has four channels each that created give us the 120 features to be inputted to the KNS neighbor model that gave us the output of that specific window and the window was shifted to the next element for the the 30 window that 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 gave us a array of list and we actually took the most frequent number of 100 elements to, in order to see what was happening on that specific time frame so then uh, that that actually gave us any prediction of what was happening during that specific one and a half seconds next slide please so in order to send us the UDP packet back to the Android application, and we had to like divide it up. So on the top, we can see there is an array of list that actually generated by the model. Then there is this filtration process that we actually used. So if there was doing nothing state that created a five class. So if there was five on the top, we actually sent a five and a null for every other actions. And uh, if there was a double eye blink, we send a one and no for every other action. And that was happening for all of the classes. 
and these packets were sent as UDP packets. This gives us the confusion matrix. So the validation of confusion matrix on the right, it gives us the confusion matrix which shows how, like on the training data set of how the validation works. So in our validation set, we use this like confusion matrix to do our calculation for accuracy, precision, and our model validation. On our test confusion matrix, it gave us the how our test like uh, inputs were working on. So this gives us an understanding of like what are the data points if the model doesn't see how that it performs. The test validation shows that there is some improvement we can make on the left and right eye blinks because they are pretty similar together uh, in terms of EEG data. In order to like improve the model accuracy, we might need to collect more data. As we train our model in 100 and, sorry, 450 data points, we might need more data points to teach the model that. And for classifying blinking with both eyes, the model performed relatively well, as we can see that for a burst of four blinks with both eyes, the model correctly classified the data. Uh, the misclassification in the beginning and end of the test file can be attributed to getting ready to collect the data and for removing the headset, while the misclassifications in the middle are mostly for Jocelyn's misclassification, which we will see in the next slide. Uh, here are the results for the Jocelyn's test file. Uh, same as before, we performed a burst of four jaw clenches, and we can see in the EEG graphs that uh, jaw clenches could be misclassified as eye blinks as they almost have the same pattern, but uh, just different magnitudes. This was also apparent to us while collecting the data, and thus we instructed the test subjects to try their best to clench softly so that we may be able to differentiate between blinks and jaw clenches. Uh, finally, for left and right blinks, the model performed much more poorly than we expected. As we can see here, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the errors over here can be attributed to both human error and noise. Uh, human errors such as head movements and inability to wink without moving the headset were the most apparent problems we saw while gathering data. All of these previously mentioned test files were not used to train the model, and as such, the model we made uh, never saw them prior to testing. Uh, so our, for our Android development uh, portion of this product, uh, we wanted it to be uh, easy for users to start and customize their actions. Also, we wanted them to have uh, a view of their brainwaves as it's coming from the EG, just so that they have a somewhat of a, a view into the, the back end portion of our of our uh, product. Uh, we built the app with Kotlin, and as mentioned previously, it supports uh, OS versions Android 8, Oreo, and up. Uh, we added uh, indicators to show connectivity with the Muse uh, as shown by the four indicators uh, here and the uh, the Bluetooth connectivity to the Muse uh, below it. Uh, and we did that just so that users can know that whether they're properly attached the headset or not. Uh, as mentioned, uh, with the confirmation pop-ups to reduce uh, false positives so that people don't ac accidentally do things that they don't want to do. And we also added a uh, direct troubleshooting capability where uh, users can send messages to the uh, support center and have them um, solve whatever issues they're experiencing with the app, whether that may be with the Muse itself or just the Android application. So we have a quick video showing our uh, app receiving the classification data through the UT through the uh, UDB packets. Uh, but before that, uh, let me explain what the graph on the left is showing. So the graph on the left shows um, different events taking place uh, inside the predicted classification data. So we have uh, double uh, double eye blinks, jaw clenches, uh, left and right eye blinks. And each of those events correlates to a uh, certain UDP packet. So you can see that at the top, uh, where it says double is 240, 63. Uh, jaw is 64 and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so now let's play the video. So this is this is the home page of our application. When you start the application, after you press start, it will take you to this page where it where it should show you the um, real time data and also the uh, connection to your to your forehead, the electric connection to your forehead. Um, the data in the red square shows the classified, uh, classified data sent through the UDP packet and being received by the mobile application. Those UDP packets each represent an event that is taking place from the data. 
Uh, and so we can use those, uh, you can, we can use those UDP packets to control our mobile smartphone. Next slide, please. Um, in conclusion, we were able to train a machine learning model for an application that has a 91.3 validation accuracy, but a 65% test accuracy. While most of the error does come from testing left and right eye blinks, there is also error present from noise that we did not previously account for. Uh, left and right eye blinks at jaw clenches were the hardest to train for, as they have a very high variability factor. Uh, that is that the signal or data point also depends on how well someone can wink, if they can at all, or how hard or softly someone clenches their jaw or winks either eye. Uh, whereas blinking with both eyes is the most trivial action that most people can do on command and has a low variability between people. Uh, one of the greatest setbacks we had was learning and implementing Android programming. Uh, the team agrees that it was a lot more involved than we previously believed and much more different than many of the languages we were all used to. As such, it was difficult for us to fully realize the final combination of our work in such a short time as we devoted our time to learning other parts of the project. Uh, finally, it is also important to note that the device we used was a Muse headset, which is a low cost EEG device and thus is not research grade like much of the references we found have used. The use of this low cost EEG device was intentional as the motivation for this project comes from the fact that this uh, model and system will be used for assisting people with paralysis and other movement difficulties, whether at home or in a medical environment such as a hospital. Uh, as for the lessons learned and as previously stated, Android programming is much more tedious okay. than we thought. Uh, we should have accounted for how much more complex Android programming was so that we could have been able to combine the rest of our uh, applets. So for anyone else that is setting out to create an Android or mobile based program, you should definitely schedule more time to learn the intricacies involved. Uh, we also learned that limiting our project to features that people would actually use is best for not only for design and implementation of the project, but also for improving ease of access and usability. Initially, we were going to introduce a sort of driving detection mode, but scrapped the idea as the likelihood of people that would use this product for driving is low. Uh, also, setbacks are unavoidable. Uh, when we first started implementing the communication layer, we assumed that the Muse headset would eventually be able to connect and communicate directly with our phone, uh, even without the software development kit of the Muse, which um, ha has restricted access. Um, thus, having a flexible design and alternate plans, such as having uh, different avenues for the communication layer, will always be beneficial. Uh, finally, we learned that we don't have to figure out everything by ourselves, and that it is, it is OK to ask for help. Uh, when we needed advice, we were able to count on some of the graduate students that our project sponsor, Dr. Contreras, is mentoring. And of course, we were also able to count on our project manager, Dr. Pei. Now, thank you. Any questions? OK, I, I think you went way over time. Uh, so again, Brian, do you want to take the first one? Yeah, great, great presentation, uh, great data. Um, I, I just. Uh, I'm not very well versed in machine learning. Uh, I'm a power guy, but I just want to get a better understanding. So the validation accuracy of 91.3% and the test accuracy, right? That's just the um, the uh, training data that you that you fed the machine learning algorithm. That's for the validation accuracy, right? For the and validation then, accuracy, yes. Oh, sorry. The test accuracy, that's real life. OK, you blink four times. I should see only four blinks on here, right? So yes, that, that part's kind of manual, right? You got to manually check that. Um, so yes, the data collection portion was actually manual. So we, ha whenever we actually collected the data, so we actually divided up. So we had a like a five-fold validation, validation and 20% of the data was used for training purposes. So whenever we collected the whole like a supervised model data, we actually divide the work into like 20% of them for testing purposes and 80% uh, for like a training and validation purposes. And uh, we actually tested our training data on them. So like those were not the portion of the data that was part of the training. So in a product development aspect, how would you automate the, the test training? Right, the test testing, right? Like it was right. maybe like some sort of like a physical counter, like you attach things to people's eyelids to track their physical blinks or something. So what we did, we actually like did did two things. Uh, actually, we actually used one of the paper that actually talks about like the amplitude of the amp, like the the signals. Uh, uh, if Xavier can go up a little bit. 
Yes, wait, wait. So like we can see the first and the last graph has like amplitudes going up and down. Those were the EEG points. They were excitements that they were like recording. So like one of the paper actually says to actually we can actually see over there and it depending on human like ability, there's like time frame before and after that we can take the data from. We actually extracted the data like that, and then we actually went back to check on the number that what was the number corresponding to what time frame on the video that we were talking about. OK, does, so that, does have, that answer your question? Because back in the data. Sorry, my apologies. So you, you still have to correlate back in the data. OK, I need to line this up. So like, yes, yeah, so we were not sure about like uh, automating the collection process. So for like for our, our own sanity, we actually went back to every single like eye blinks, jaw clinches. Uh, we actually went back to verify them like in the accuracy time from starting was correct, but we actually collected the data in an automated process. Very cool. Thank you. Break. You want to be the next one? Yeah, so the, that's interesting that Brian jumped straight to the uh, validation accuracy and test accuracy because I, I was going to ask the same thing. Um, I understand the test accuracy, but I, I was curious, how did you come up with the 91.3% validation accuracy? So like uh, the MATLAB has a portion like we can actually use directly in the built in command to calculate the accuracy for the validation and, all, and also for the test accuracy. But we can actually take the true positive rate and like false negative rate and then we can use like a, a calculation that like the formulas are already there that we can implement them for. OK. Does it answer the question? My apologies. So that was you, you created the model and mm -hmm. then the validation accuracy was just testing samples against your model. Is that correct? So yes, so the cross validation happens when whenever like we are training the model, the training data set is divided up into like five sections and then it, it is shuffled again. And if 20% of those training sets were taken out to be tested for the validation of the model to be like a give a validation accuracy of the model. OK. Doc? I, I just wanted to add, uh, this is a really cool. I don't know if you heard the news, right? There was this, uh, this guy, you know, uh, fully paralyzed, and they're using brain signals to, to talk to him. Right, so uh, FYI, look that up once once you finish with it. Very recently, it came; it was published. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard of that one before. Interesting. No, to Pepe might know. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> Anybody else, Doug? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. It's oh, technology works. Uh, so I thanks guys for the presentation. Um, I, I would like to congratulate you for choosing an ambitious project. I think it was ambitious and you didn't shy away from it. And that's really a good thing. And I kind of like the way that when uh, Mario didn't show up, one of you could just step in and fill in. You know, that shows really that the whole team understood the whole project. And that's, uh, you know, that's a very big positive in my point of view to be able to deal with adversity and respond like that. So good. You know, that's a, a check, a check mark in your favor. So here's a tip about uh, foilsmanship. When you show me a foil with a lot of words on it, I start to read the words and I stop listening to what you have to say. So if you're going to do a slide with words on it, there should be very few words on it, uh, as few as possible, just enough to convey what you're trying to, to, to convey to your audience and rely maybe more on graphics and so that people will listen to what you're saying to them. Uh, because then, I, you know, as in the, it happened in this case, I'm trying to read all the fine print in your boxes and I'm not hearing what you're telling me and you're probably telling me some good important information. So that's a tip on foilsmanship. 
And here's a, a thing about a, a subtlety about um, machine learning that you maybe didn't pick up on, although I think it was there. Most of the people, I'm not an expert on it, but most of the people that I talk to that try to do machine learning, when they try to train um, the use training data for a model, they're talking about like 100,000 data points and in many cases, a million data points. And so you did like 450 or whatever, whatever the number was, you know, I was maybe expecting that you would say, you know, we just didn't have enough data points. I was hoping that you would draw that conclusion in your uh, when you looked at your data, because that's kind of the what the, what's happening now in the quote unquote real world. If you want to use machine learning, that's a good thing because you can accomplish wonderful things with it. But you better have a lot of money because you're going to need a lot a big data set if you're going to do it. And you better have a lot of time to optimize. And, you know, that's one of the things I would have hoped you would have learned or gotten out of this uh, experience, and which is the whole point of, you know, being questions about the test accuracy. You know, 65 percent, you should have said, oh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, and and uh, the other point is, I was hoping that you would say more about your capture window, because when you start trying to uh, capture these things, um, if you're trying to capture four blinks and you get three blinks and then another blink shows up maybe a, a later time, do you count it? Do you count um, it as the as the fourth blink or do you count it as the next capture, right? Is is this the first one of the next three coming or is this the fourth one of the three that you already heard? And what if the person only wanted to do one one blink by itself? So the way you have to resolve that is you have to have a capture window where say I'm going to capture in this window and then I'm going to make a determination in this window and everything else is in another window. And uh, I, you know, I didn't hear you uh, talk about that or that you discovered that that was going to be important when you try to resolve this. Of course, the data you had, you always had four successive blinks pretty much equally spaced. Um, so those are good for robot uh, blinking, but they may not be so good for human blinking. Uh, but anyway, those are my comments. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, once again, congratulations for taking on an ambitious project. I think, uh, you know, I think it was looks like it was a great learning experience for you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, so uh, about one thing that we actually forgot to mention. <laughs> so we actually when we collected the data, it was equally time spaced. And uh, when we are going to be implementing in, into the machine learning model, as we we also face the problem of like not not capturing the exact like uh, the actions we wh what we have is we are going to be implementing a uh, uh, guidance for the user. So we as a human, we have natural blinks like we have to do every like six times every minute, uh, six to eight times every minute. So there's like eight to ten seconds that we have in between every blinks that we do. So what we were supposed what we are going to implement is we are going to have a window of time designated for the user to be like a be for the preparation to give a command and uh, like it, when the window opens up for like receiving command the android application is going to say like the capturing and the person is going to be putting in a uh, command so that is something we were going to be implementing on a later stage as we are developing the process yeah so you did learn it you just didn't tell me that you learned it <laughs> yes sir <laughs> <laughs> So like that slipped our mind to like in inform our like a uh, presenter about that. We apologize. Any more questions, comments from IAP members? If not, it's the twelve. Would you take over the screen? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Pay, we're all here. Okay. The screen is yours. OK, let's go. Sorry, hold on just one minute. I got to. OK, I reset the time. <laughs> I forgot to share the the uh, audio with it. That's my mistake. OK.
Okay, here we go, and uh, we'll start with Clint. And uh, here we are. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for staying with us so late today. Uh, we are at Team 12, and our project this semester was a non-lethal avian deterrent apparatus, or not over short. My name is Clint Lowe, and I am the team lead for this, and I will let my team members introduce themselves. Hey, everyone. My name is Matthew Blom, the CPE of the team. My name is Avery Walker. My name is Samaya Palakanda. My name is Ken Germandu. And our project manager for this semester was Dr. Pei, and our advisor was Dr. Province. Next slide, please. So first, we want to give a little background on the problem we're trying to solve. So next slide, please. So up to 40% of the global food supply is loss of pest damage. Of this, avian, uh, avian damage is a significant portion of it. We found that vineyards in California get up to 16.1% yield loss from avian damage alone. Furthermore, the USDA estimates that damage from starlings and crows, which are just two species, is $150 million uh, annually in the United States. Next slide, please. So a little background on the traditional control methods that have been used for many years now. Uh, the first sort of obvious one is lethal control, which we can see right there with the guy with the uh, holding the gun. Uh, this, of course, you know, is damaging towards the environment because we're killing these species. But in terms of a more legal perspective, it can only be applied for certain species, namely invasive species like the European starlings. Chemical. Now, chemical is a very broad category. There's lots of different sort of chemical deterrents that are used, but in general, they are expensive to apply and reapply and may or may not be safe for humans, depending on the exact chemical. Static scare devices like the stereotypical scarecrow, which you can see in the top right, the tried and true uh, deterrent method for birds. While this method may be effective in the short range, short term, uh, short time, it will lose effectiveness over time. The birds will get used to the figure, they'll get used to the shape of it, and they just won't really care anymore. They'll learn it's not really a threat. Netting, um, netting is very effective in general. However, it does degrade over time being plastic. And being that we're talking about many acres of farmland in general, it is very time consuming to install this and uninstall this. And of course, it is expensive to cover that much area. So now I'll be passing off to Avery. Okay, everyone, so I'd like to present uh, our proposed solution to this problem. Um, as you can see with some text here on the screen, uh, our NADA system, it uses a water jet and a sound system as deterrent methods. Um, and so we, uh, we use uh, redundancy here. Um, so if one doesn't work, maybe the other will. And so we're trying to combine two methods in one, and we're gonna use smart image recognition. So uh, we, uh, we plan to use a neural network and uh, Matt will explain a little bit more later. Um, and so this will provide an accurate means to detect birds, and uh, we want to um, avoid targeting, um, you know, humans. So, uh, and we want our NADA to be compact and movable, and allows the user to move the device to problem areas. So here's our de design over uh, overview diagram here. Um, so th this is a box, this silver box down at the bottom. This is our uh, NADA enclosure. Uh, for us, it's 3D printed. And uh, that holds all of our electronics on the inside to keep it away from the water. As you see on the top um, with the blue water coming out, that's the water nozzle. Right below the water nozzle, there's a black box. That's a pan tilt kit, and that's controlled by a Raspberry Pi. As you can see in the middle of the silver box, that's the brains of our operation. And if you look in the bottom left, um, you can see the a green uh, diamond uh, with a camera coming out. So that's our camera, and, it, um, and that's what looks for birds, and it tells the Raspberry Pi. Um, if it's a bird or not, and then you can see at the bottom, on the bottom left, there's a speaker, so that's our redundancy system. And uh, for electronics, we have a stepper driver that um, regulates the voltage um, to our uh, pan tilt, and we have an amplifier for our speaker, and at the bottom right, uh, you can see a switching circuit that controls the solenoid that um, will open and close the water valve. And I'll pass it off to Samaya. <clears throat> Hi there, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. My name is Samaya Palakanda. As I mentioned before, I'll be going over the deliverables with you guys. So overall, what we wanted to do was uh, create an adaptive, accurate bird deterrent system, which would have uh, image recognition that would detect birds, and then it would decide which method of deterrent to use. Would it spray water or would it use the speaker system to get the birds away? I'll be going into the specifications and uh, I'll be I'll just go through the main ones with you guys. 
So in terms of the avian pest recognition, we just wanted an effective distance of about six meters. And as for the accuracy, we wanted it above 50%, of course. We wanted a high process, uh, I mean, a low processing time, just so, you know, that the birds don't have a chance to really get away before we can actually activate the whole system. Now we want, uh, going on to the water jet system, uh, we wanted the water jet system to spray water up to eight meters, and uh, we wanted it to be controlled by the Raspberry Pi. Um, as for the speaker system, we wanted to actually play five preds for sounds and also manage to play a frequency speed, uh, sweep from 300 hertz to 50 kilohertz. And as for the power source, we wanted to kind of make a more compact version. So we wanted to uh, input 12 volts from any 12 volt source with two amps and deliver the right amount of power to power each part of each component of the of the system, of the NADA system. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the results. Next slide, please. So first, let me begin with the accomplishment. So this, as you can see, this is a picture of all the insides of our NADA system. It can be powered, as Samaya said, by any 12 volt source. Um, as a compromise, we decided to isolate it into two power sources, one just to drive the speaker to make sure you get the full power of it, and another one just to power the Raspberry Pi and all the rest of the electronics. Uh, we designed also a 3D enclosure, which we 3D printed. As you can see, it's in green. Um, it has some basic tracking for like face recognition and some uh, laser tracking as well. Uh, it is integrated with a camera that is completely controlled by the Raspberry Pi, and it can play any sort of the tearing sounds or whatever sound you want to play from either the internet or you want to load it. The Raspberry Pi has full connectivity, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever you want. So you can interface it directly with it or you can SSH through any other computer. Um, and we measure a spray distance of up to 18 feet. That's the max we got. Next slide, please. Um, of course, with any project, there are always setbacks once you put everything together. Uh, First, we have the bird recognition. Uh, we could not find any pre-trained neural networks that were effective. All the ones that um, we worked on were either slow or they had a very low degree of accuracy. So we would have to train our own, but that is expensive and needs more time, more resources, which we do not have, sadly, for this project. But we did the best that we could with whatever resources we, we had. Um, the other setback we had is that some components were damaged due to current and voltage impulses. As you can, as you know, a lot of the components like work separately, but once you integrate them, there's always like other issues that you do not see until you put everything together connected. So uh, we had some issues of some uh, capacitors that were fried and some ICs, but we replaced everything and managed to get it work. Uh, so yeah, most of the components that affected were either the uh, amplifier circuit and the servos. Next slide, please. Here's a picture where you can see our assemble system. Um, it has a speaker on the side, it has a camera, uh, and it has the pan tilt on the top, controlled by two servos, which just aim the nozzle in any direction forward. Uh, next slide. And here's another picture showing Somaya as our test target, and you can see in the picture there, he uh, the software is recognizing his face, and it also has some color coding so that he can detect the laser in red in his neck. Next. Now I'll leave it to Matt. Hey everybody, Matt here. Um, so as we can see with the video that we're about to play for you, here's a little bit of a test demo of some of our, uh, at least with the servo and the uh, the speaker, if you wouldn't mind press and play. I'll do it again. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. That's pretty loud. You can make it louder, though. Yeah, I can make it louder. So that's uh, a demo we took prior to um, installing some libraries that may or may not have blown some of the servos, fried them. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that's the best that we have at the moment uh, to show you of their functionality. Uh, next slide, please. Do it again. OK. So, cool. My mistake. No worries. Um, and here we have a little uh, demo, at least, of the face tracking software and at least the red dot detection. If you wouldn't mind playing. Thank you, Avery. Now, as you can notice, uh, the face tracking works pretty well. 
the red dot tracking is a little bit more difficult due to the contrast uh, and the light fixture of the camera that's coming in. Um, so as you can see, there was lots of dots popping up on the screen. Uh, next slide. All right, summary. So what all of it put together, what were the lessons learned? Um, being a firmware guy myself, uh, neural networks are sort of difficult to implement on the RPI due to size. Uh, looking straight forward from this project, I ideally wanted a toolkit that would run through a training program, uh, depending on wherever you placed it, uh, and it would gather environmental data based on pictures and sounds um, to train its own model right there on the spot. But unfortunately, with the RPIs that they make these days, uh, it's it's not enough processing power to do that on the spot. So pre-trained, pre we decided were was a better format for our bird detection system. Um, we did upload a uh, bird classification uh, model to the RPI. Unfortunately, the way that it worked, it, it spent so much time trying to figure out what exactly the bird was, um, at least what species it was, that it didn't really nail down uh, the, the shape and the actual imaging processing um, quick enough for our results. So we looked through some of those and we decided, okay, well, at least we can present a simple face tracking algorithm um, that had a red dot aperture focus just to help where the servos were looking at the time. We could basically match them up. Uh, training models that we looked at, the, training them were not easy. Uh, we needed to be accurate and fast and lightweight uh, in order to implement within our system. And of course, we learned with through <laughs> burning several of our servos that make sure uh, to test them before adding to the project uh, using servo libraries that are several years old, may not be compatible with recent updates, um, and it may hamper and destroy your system. Next slide, please. And for our acknowledgement, we would like to thank Dr. Pei, Dr. De La Rosa, and Dr. Province for their continued support. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So, Brian, want to take it again? So, I, I think uh, I'll let Blake go because that, that way I won't steal his questions. But I, I do have some good ones <laughs> regarding water. Uh, go but ahead. I'll, I'll let Blake go ahead. Okay. So, uh, the first thing I wanted to mention was um, so you have the, the spray and the speaker that that's not redundancy that's variety right redundancy would be you detect if your speaker fails and you have a second speaker as a backup right um so then the, the the other thing i was curious about is did you take the speaker or the water jet out to a, a farm or a park or something and see which one works better Yeah, I, I can take that. So uh, that was right when we were getting to the testing phase where we we're hoping to do that. That's when we had the incident that caused these servos to, uh, well, fry. And so we weren't able to fully test it like, like we wanted to. Uh, it, it happened way too late for us to, uh, to fix the issue. So unfortunately, we didn't get to test it nearly as much as we hoped to. Okay. Um... So I'm, I'm a vision guy. I, I do a lot of machine vision projects. And so rather than trying to find the algorithm that works for birds that's you know already proven out and you just use it, um, it seems like what you could have done is, you know, if, if you just envision the cameras looking out into the sky and a bird is gonna be, look, it's gonna look like a black dot in the field of view right so you could have maybe simplified the detection of the bird by just using contrast rather than some algorithm that's out there specific to determining not only is it a bird but what kind of bird is it right did, uh, did you yes guys... mm -hmm. oh sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you um no, so i was just gonna just ask if you guys had, uh, thought you know put any thought into that yeah we had some i i i perused through several models that actually did take that that uh, flatness of the background. Um, per our model design, however, with it being in sort of a woodland setting or around a crop setting, um, 
it may have been better to angle at least looking looking back on it now angle it more towards the sky we were worried more about ground based pests so the whole thought came to me how are you going to train this for a specific location each time and so that's why we went with just something at least classification simply but in the future for future work on this project that definitely would be a route to go okay um and the the only other thing with this being an outdoor system uh back to the the ratings you know you know it, it should be designed to a certain ip rating um so that it's going to handle the elements being you know if if it's out on a farm it's going to going to have uh you know weather um rain perhaps freezes so the the components probably need a uh, a temperature rating and a, an ingress protection rating uh, i can take on that one uh so basically since it's in close it's technically nema one rating uh on top of that we didn't test for like ip68 or any sort of those uh, more advanced ratings for it but all the components are able to deal anywhere between zero degrees which is 32 fahrenheit to 125 degrees Celsius. So they can deal with scorching heat of Texas, for example, and they could go in any environment that that would be, that's like an acceptable range for like a Texas setting, for example. Uh, so in, in that sense, yeah, I know from the technicalities of the electronics, they can handle just above freezing, under freezing that they're not suitable for that application. Um, and then for the enclosure, Clint designed it, uh, so I don't know if, if you could expand more on that. Yeah, so uh, as Kevin said, we don't have uh, information on a specific um, rating. However, we did consider a lot of the water into the design because, of course, seeing water and electronics is never a good mix. We designed uh, drip guards to kind of prevent water from getting on the camera and the speaker itself. The servos were sealed with silicone around the base, and all the ports essentially were sealed with um, electronic safe silicone to prior to prevent water from getting into the device in the future uh and, and this is again was just a little too late to implement i would like to add an o-ring around the lid um that was just something that we i we didn't have time to do last minute but we did test this uh back before our server was fried and i ran this i sprayed it i had it moving around and zero water got into the system. So for this prototype, which is kind of what we were striving for, uh, we were happy with the waterproofing as is, but there definitely needs to be more improvement on adding a sort of more fail safe to the water system, like the O-ring I mentioned, and getting a specific IP rating. OK, very good. Thank you. Doug, you want to go next? Oh, uh, sure. Save the, we'll save the best to Brian to wrap up. OK, um, so I was going to bring up the same point that Blake did about environmental. Uh, just looking at your apparatus, it didn't look to me like it was going to be very robust in an outdoor environment. But uh, you uh, you did kind of follow up with more information than in your presentation. So I think you uh, begin to answer some of those questions, which are, I think are a big question uh, for this particular project. I am quite surprised that a Raspberry Pi could operate at an ambient of 125 C. That means that it would have a junction uh, temperature of something like 150. And that's kind of like an industrial spec rather than a Raspberry Pi spec. So I think I would double check that spec uh, for, for the Raspberry Pi, which leads me to the, to the next point. And that is, it seems like you discovered a lot of things in the implementation that might have been sussed out during the design phase so you know it just seems to me that you if you'd really uh, done a good job of design you would have known that the raspberry pi couldn't do the job and that is had you estimated the data rate and the the data quantity etc cetera, etc cetera, you would have known before start bending metal hey this is just not gonna this is not a design that's gonna that it's gonna meet the spec uh, so, and I think there are several places that where I think you could make the same comment where, you know, had you really thought about it and really investigated it in the divine, the, the design phase, you wouldn't have had to wait until you implemented it to say, oops, that is just not going to work. 
Um, that's a, that's come now. I did like your engineering spec. I, I like a detailed engineering spec. The only point I would make about that is that um, you don't actually believe it or not have to fulfill the engineering spec in order to succeed. What you have to fulfill is the product spec, the the one that the customer wants. The customer doesn't necessarily un, uh, need to know what approach you use. You can change the approach as long as you deliver what the customer wants. And so the focus really should be on the customer spec because you have there you don't have a lot of flexibility. But on the engineering spec, you can change the engineering spec as long as you deliver what the customer wants. And, and so I like the fact that you had detailed specs because it told me that you thought about it and you thought about the various aspects of it. Uh, but I just wanted to make the point that it's really the customer spec that matters. Uh, and, and so I'm, it's not really so much a criticism as just taking the opportunity to get on my soapbox and, uh, and make that point. So thanks guys for the presentation. Okay, Brian. Thank you. Would you also wrap up and speak to the whole group? Sure, uh, I, I did have some comments, right? I'm a power guy, right? So Blake covered the image tracking recognition uh really you had a lot of subcomponents right you had tracking you had directional control with those servers you had payload delivery for water and sound right um you have but the power requirements what kind of power source do you need to support all that right and then closure to you know keep that robust right so it start it sounds like you started with I'm, i want to go with a raspberry pi and everything has to go with that where well, you first need to start. Okay, I need I need to get some birds out of here, right? What what water pressure do I need to scare off a bird? Is it a little like a little trickle, you know? How, how strong of a water pressure do you need? I, I didn't see that, right? You know, you're trying to solve this customer's problem. You're you're working backwards, right? Um, start with a the problem, then work your way towards. Oh, actually, I need some some other type of control system, not a, maybe not a Raspberry Pi is not enough, right? Because um, that's how you get to those, oh, this thing I was started with is not gonna support this big motor I'm trying to run, right? So anyway, I think everyone, uh, Blake and Doug pretty much covered uh, a lot of what I, was, what I was gonna say. But anyway, very fun project. Uh, Would have liked to see more, more out of it. Um, again, really need to stress the importance of literature review um but also you know start with the problem right you know in the design don't start with the you know i, I want to start with an arduino you know don't start with the control method you know start with the payload delivery right um, then that'll give you what you need right How, what power requirements you know do i need a battery this, is this going to be plugged in to an outlet somewhere because it's stationary it doesn't need a battery it's not going anywhere right um who knows, right? So anyway, thank you to all the students who presented. Um, really great job. Uh, these projects are very, very time consuming on top of all the work you have in, in class, right? Um, so don't feel discouraged that, you know, with our critiques, you know, we, we've been there too, right? My senior design project did not succeed. I'll, I'll just be up, up front with you, right? Um, but I, I'm, you know, you go into the, once you start working, you start learning, you start learning more. So hopefully this is the gateway into finally making money. You know, now you get to go on vacations, right? Support your family. <laughs> right. um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so again, great work, uh, great effort. Um, I hope our comments were were helpful in your future careers. Okay, Brick and Doug, anything else you want to add to the whole group? Well, no, I think this is the 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 thing where where you put all the pieces together, right? Uh, all of those courses that you took. Uh, this is the place where you say, "Oh, I know how to use these tools, uh, and I know how to use these tools to solve a problem." Because that's really what a company wants when they hire people. What they want problem solvers. And what your university course has uh, curriculum has taught you is here's a suite of tools that you have. Here's some knowledge. Here's some skills. Here's some software. Here's some uh, here's some theory. 
that you can use and it's up to you to put them all together and come up with a solution and there is no answer in the back of the book it is you got to use your imagination to put all of this together and your creativity to do it and so this is where it all comes together this is where you determine well did it pay off or not did you know can i use all of these skills and and tools that i've been given uh, during the four or five years that I've been in this curriculum. And so you've got a good sense yourself, right? After doing this project of how well you learned this and how well you didn't, that that's the most valuable thing to take, take away from this is what did I learn from this about me and about uh, how to go about a project? So those are my comments and, and thanks for the opportunity, Dr. Pei, for speaking. Okay. Nothing else. So thank you, everyone. And my apologize for the mess I make at the beginning. So I think whoever take over, that's wonderful crisis management. So I think that's actually an important part of the project management. We always run into crisis. We have to manage that. And uh, my apologize again. And job well done, all teams. And thank you to all IAB members for your time. I budget 20 minutes for contingency and the run over time. So that's my fault at the beginning. Hey, I'll take a lunch, Dr. Peg. <laughs> I like steak. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, no, we, we, we love to support. Well, I love to treat you with steak. <laughs> so let's get together sometime. Oh, because okay. I, 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 I love to meet all you guys face to face. Hey, let's do it. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you very much, sir. And whoever in charge of the, the, the team, please share the video link with me. Yes, I'll uh, stop the recording now. <laughs>